السلام عليكم I have a microphone and you don't. Assalamu alaikum. Whoa. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu rasulullah. Fa'ina istaqa hadithi kitab Allah. Wa khairu hari hari Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa shuru umuri mutatataha wa kuli mutatataha bid'a. وكل بدلة دلالة كل دلالة في النوم بعد. Praises to Allah and we thank Him and we ask for His peace and blessings to be upon Muhammad. The best speech is in the Book of Allah. The best following is to follow Muhammad, the last and final prophet. And The worst of all things that anybody could come up with is to invent something in Islam that doesn't belong there. Because those inventions are misleading, misguiding the Lala. And all of that misguidance winds up going into the fire. And that's exactly what we don't want. We seek refuge with the Lala from that. I mean. And having said that, I would like to address a few questions. And then assure you that there is a way for you to get answers to all your questions. But in the interest of time, many of you have things that you need to do. And I also have another program tomorrow night anyway. I think you heard about that one. Maybe you'll come be with us over there. What I'll do is answer a few and then try to give the ones that I usually get. Then you can go to our websites and find so many answers to questions there. At Islam Always, Islam Yesterday, and IslamTomorrow.com. First question here, it says, what advice do you give us to bring people to Islam? We have a brand new CD that we put together based on many programs just like this. where I explain to the people what Islam is, the words, what they mean. And then a radio show, do a Christian radio show, where they interviewed me and asked me questions. I explained Islam and Jihad in about four minutes. And they loved it. So much that they broadcast it and put it up on the internet. And I said, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> We need that for us. So that's there. Then about eight minutes explaining the word Allah. The explanation I gave you tonight, only a lot more because I took it from some of the textbooks. And then, what is the Shahada? We broke that down to talk about it. And then we gave an example, you can hear a man walk up on the stage and make his shahada or enter into Islam. Then we put another one there, which was a lady who also, in another occasion, wanted to come to Islam. And then the audio track of a video we have called 135 people make shahada, or 135 people enter Islam. And that was in a university in Curacao a couple of years ago. 135 people in the audience stood up and said, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Alhamdulillah. Then after that, we have another section of the CD that talks about how to help the people after they get into Islam, which I think maybe is as important as the rest of the whole subject. And then we summed it all up. and talked about how to use our internet websites for Dawah. All of this is free. There's no price tag on what I do because I want to be paid by Allah. I need that. I don't need you. I need Him. I love you for Allah. Do you notice that? But not instead of Allah. I pray to Him to take care of what we need to do to spread this message. Because if he gives us the success, 
everything will be fine. But if he doesn't, all the money in the world is not going to help us. There's too many people today from all religions, even Muslims, running around collecting money and then doing nothing with it. At least nothing to help promote the deen. And I don't need to join that group. So that's my advice. Don't look at the dawah as a commercial enterprise. Don't try to treat it like a business, because it isn't. It's tijara with the law, yes. You're making business with the law. But don't try to commercialize on it, because it don't work. Next question. How did your family react when you went to Islam? <laughs> Whoa. Well, I already told you my dad accepted Islam, but the rest of my family lived down in Houston, and my mom did not go for that. My mom was a school teacher for 40 years. She taught the special ed department, mentally retarded, they used to call. She wrote curriculum. She's a very educated person, very educated. But she looked me in the face and she said, God is three. Just like that. I said, really? The Bible said one. She said, yes, God is one and God is three. I said, Mom, you're an educated person. You know math and you know English. Mathematically, one can never equal three and three can never equal one. I've never seen any equation where a number changes without something happening to it. One is one, three is three. Grammatically, it's incorrect to have a plural for the subject but the verb is singular. These are. These are. Those are. This is. So when you say God, you have to say is. Right? But then the nominative can't be plural because it's singular. God is one, that works. But if you're going to say God is three, you have to say God are three. Then you have to go back and say gods are three if you want to be correct in English. You know what she said? You just don't understand. You just have to have faith. Just have to have faith and then numbers don't matter anymore. And language doesn't matter anymore. And common sense doesn't matter anymore as long as you have faith. Huh? Their reaction was very negative. But good news. After time, I stopped arguing. I started out debating. Uh, I had seen some debate tapes and I thought that's the way to call the people to Islam. How many of you seen any debate tapes? You've seen them? Everybody saw them, right? Tell you what you do. Go out, memorize those tapes, then go out here and try it yourself and see what happens. It's not going to work. You're just going to make an argument. And another argument, and another argument, and another argument, and another argument. If you like to argue, go to Pal Talk. Those are what they do all the time over there. Argue, argue, argue. Boy, did I slam him. Boy, did I put him down. Ha, ha, ha. Have you seen that? You know what I'm talking about? We said the best guidance is to follow Muhammad. Yes? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Did he do that? Did he cut people down? Make fun of them? Ridicule them? Condescend? Yes or no? You know he never did that. Even when they attacked him, abused him, threw stones on him at Tayyip, he prayed for them. Yes or no? And this was the way of all the prophets. Even when their people turned against them, they would be amazed. How could you turn against me? I'm coming to you with a message of salvation. But they still prayed for them. Yes? So why are we 
taking this attitude of I have to smash these people. Huh? And what if, what if that Christian that you're out here picking on today, insulting today, cutting down his Bible, trying to make fun of him, trying to find something wrong with what he says, what if he made his shahada, how will you embrace him tomorrow as your brother? Huh? Won't you be a little bit shy to realize how you talk to him? Did you forget that Allah told us that he made all of us from the same person? Did you forget that all of us came from Adam and Eve? Did you know that Allah said that nobody knows for sure who's going and who ain't? People go through their whole life acting like somebody of the hellfire. But at the last minute, they become believers and they go to paradise and vice versa. People act like somebody going to paradise at the last minute. They blow it and they go to hell. Is that summation? I know it says you know, arm length away, but you know what I'm talking about. Hmm? You want to keep debating them, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to ruin your opportunity here in Australia. You're going to make this unfit for your children to live in. Don't do it. Islam is not about manadhara. It never was. It's not about debate. Islam is about what? Conveying a message and praying for the people. And ask yourself, with these people who debate, did they tell you to get up in the night and cry and pray for the person? No. They won't. But that's exactly what Prophet Sallallahu used to do. That's exactly what I do. And that's exactly what the man did for me who was giving me dollar. Because I caught him one night. Yes. I got up for something and I went downstairs and I saw him in the living room in the dark. And I could tell he was doing something and I asked him later, what was that? I thought you guys only pray five times a day. Was that a prayer? He said, yeah, it's a nice prayer, but I'll tell you later. After I got to Islam, I remembered it and I went to him and I said, Were you praying for me to come to Islam that Allah would guide me that night I caught you down there? He said, Every night. Every night. Do you get up and do that for somebody to get to Islam? Maybe that's why you didn't see anybody make shahada. The people of Dawa, real Dawa, taught me this. You make your Dawa in the day. And you make your du'a in the night. Like a farmer plants the seeds in the day. And then you water it with your tears at night. And maybe Allah will have mercy. And let them come to Islam. And maybe Allah will have mercy and forgive you for not doing a better job. Next question. How many priests <laughs> become Muslims in the United States? Oh, and another one, how many leave Islam? Okay, now well, that's fair. That's very fair. I don't know how many priests go to Islam. But I do know a lot of them that I talked to that didn't go, but they said Islam was the right religion. Father John in Arlington, Texas, he's the chaplain for the Catholics on campus at the Texas University. He loves to come around the Muslims. Every event we had, he was coming around being with us, helping. He'd be the usher, maybe he'd move chairs. He was just there, he was like, you know. One time I called him up, I said, Father John, it just seems to me like you like Islam. He said, yes. And you like the Muslims? He said, yes. I said, can I ask you a question? I didn't know anything about Dawah. I just asked him straight out. Why don't you become a Muslim? He said, and lose my job? <laughs> How many leave Islam? I don't know about the priests leaving Islam. I don't think I heard of any of them that left, but I do know that some people go in Islam and they leave. Some of them, they get the wrong notion. They go in for one reason. It's not the right reason, so they go back out. Other people, get turned off by the things they see us do as Muslims and they leave. Yeah, I saw that. 
But some people enter with an agenda and plan to leave when they came in just to make trouble for everybody. That happened to me when I was in Virginia. After a speech like this, I had the microphone and a man said, let me have the microphone, I want to say something. I said, okay, I gave him the microphone. It was Egyptian, I could tell by his face and everything, he looked Egyptian. He was speaking with Arabic accent. He even said, Jazakallah khair, which means Allah increase you and all that's good. And then he said, it's, you know, good for you that you're in a country, meaning America, where you can be a preacher, a priest, and then switch over to become a Muslim. And nobody will say anything, and you can even preach about it. But in my country, in Egypt, he says, and he's got the microphone, he's walking away now shouting at the people I used to be a scholar of Islam he says and I became a Christian and they want to kill me they want to cut my head off he says I'm shocked how can this guy do this we got it on videotape if you doubt what I'm telling you watch it for yourself amazing I'm watching this guy go he said I've got it all on tape it's all here I've got my tapes they're five dollars three for ten and we got I'm going what's this there were some people who had come that night to enter to Islam. We had a lot of people at the university who had planned on going into Islam. And here's this guy putting on a, on a road show here. And I'm thinking, my God. And he's got the microphone. You know what it's like not to have it? Try it like this and see what happens. Now you see the difference? I looked down on the stage and I saw it look like a snake moving. It was the wire for the microphone. I stomped on it. And when I did, he went doing, 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 doing. I reached down, I grabbed the cable, started pulling him back. Like a fish, you know. And I got him right up to the edge of the stage. I reached down and took the microphone. I said, you're a bad boy. I had no clue. But I asked the people, is anybody here with this man? It was a certain group all raised their hand. They said they were Coptic Christians. They were with him. I said, does this man's behavior represent your religion? They said, well, no. I said, well, how many of you support the way he just did that? They said, we don't. I said, well, I'm going to ask you guys, do you want him to stay or go? And they said, go. So I told them, you better behave or else I'm going to take your friend's suggestion. I didn't know really what to say to this man, but I, I just knew that didn't sound right. The way he did it, the way he came across, especially because he's out here selling his tapes at our event. But I got the chance a year later to go to Cairo, Egypt. So I went to the very university that he claimed that he was a professor at. A scholar of Islam, he said. And I asked the scholars there, and I got the video camera out, and I asked them on tape to tell us about this situation. Immediately they knew who we were talking about. They said he uses the name Mustafa, doesn't he? I said, yeah, that's him. They said, yes, we know all about him. Yes, he was a professor of history. And yes, he was here, but he knew nothing about Islam. He accepted Islam right here at this university, and he had a certificate that said so in Arabic, and that's what he was showing the people in the United States, saying that he was a scholar. It was actually his shahada. And then he left Islam because they gave him money from one of the churches there to do it. And the government of Egypt doesn't support that kind of activity. And yes, they want to kick him out because that makes trouble. People kill each other over that kind of stuff there. So they didn't want him back. His government did kick him out. True. But then they said, next time you see him, shake hands with him. And while you've got his hand, just slide his shirt back a little bit and look right here on his wrist. Anybody here been in Egypt? Know any Coptic Christians you know what I'm talking about? What's on his wrist? Salim, the cross. You know. He said because he was born as a Christian, raised as a Christian, 
and did it as a trick just to upset the Muslims. And I said, Alhamdulillah, Allah, the Jannah Muslim. Because in our religion, in Islam, there's no room for that kind of activity. We cannot play games like that. And some people have gone to the extent to go to Muslim countries and tell little children, if you need something, why don't you ask Muhammad? They do that to these little kids. And of course, they say, you want candy? They say, yeah. Say, oh Muhammad, oh Muhammad, nothing happens. Now say, Jesus, say, Jesus, Jesus. And they say, Jesus, and they throw candy through the windows of the school. So the kids see the candy coming in. I heard about that. Is that the way you sell your religion? Now, to be fair, Christians don't do that. That's just a few missionaries. But still, it shows that some people misrepresent their religion really bad. Because the Bible doesn't give them permission to do that. Christianity doesn't allow people to act like that. But you know something else? To be fair again, there are some people out there claiming to represent Islam, and they sure don't represent us. True? But still we have to let Allah deal with these people. When did I enter Islam? Next question. July 15th, 1991. Alhamdulillah. And second question with it, and how do you find Islam? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. I'm reminded of one time when I was in Hajj with one of the big scholars of Hadith from Egypt. His name is uh, Muhammad Hussein. Uh, what's his name? He has a big, huge beard. We were in Hajj. He said, about Hajj, that it was beautiful like the flowers. I said, that's the way Islam is to me, beautiful like the flowers. I love it. Alhamdulillah. Last question. That was it. Oh, we got some more over here. Oh, they're asking advice for somebody not Muslim that's seeking the truth but is hesitant. The same thing I always tell everybody. Take everything one step at a time. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get in a hurry. Be sure you're right. Be sure you understand what you're doing. If you have a reservation, if something's bothering you, ask like I asked. God guide me. If he wants you to know, he'll guide you to the truth. You'll know and you'll be fine. That's what you got to do. You cannot force Islam on somebody else and you can't force it on yourself. Do we have any tonight here who accepted Islam? You made a conscious decision at some point in your life. You said, I want to be a Muslim and you started practicing Islam. Please raise your hands. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. That's great. One of the things that happens to us though, when we get into Islam, we have a tendency to try to go too fast, do too much, too soon. It happens. You want to do everything. We're so excited, you know. It's like you've been starving all your life and somebody turns you loose in a candy shop, you know. But that's dangerous. You got to go one step at a time. Because Allah doesn't get interested and excited about you coming to Islam with a whole bunch of stuff and then leaving tomorrow. Do what you can do. Do the minimum, step by step. As you understand, practice that. This is the way the Prophet used to insist. When he sent Mu'ad bin Jabal to Yemen, he told him, I'm sending you to a land of the Christians Teach them Tawheed. He also said in another hadith, teach them about La ilaha illallah, and if they accept that, then teach them about Muhammad Rasulullah. In other words, step by step. And then teach them Salah. And then teach them Zakat. The worship, the charity. Step by step. Next question. Is the Egyptian still around? 
He went back to Upper Egypt. Alhamdulillah. Ah, this one is a question from Pal Talk. They said that the non-Muslims often say we worship a god, a moon god. Is this something spread among the Christians in general? Not really. What happened, there was one person in California, Dr. Robert Morey, who wrote a book, the name of it, The Moon God, called Allah. He refers some, to some archaeological findings and the reference to some anthropologists who have discovered some things in Yemen and other places in Arabia that indicate that people long, long ago had a god that they worshiped, the moon god. Okay? And all of us know from what we just said tonight that the word in Arabic for the one god has always been a law anyway. The people of Muhammad's time, peace be upon him, even before message came, they said a law. Even the Christians said a law. Even the Jews said a law. And even the Mushrikeen said a law. The people who were the pagans, idolaters, basically non believers, still use the word a law. To associate that word Allah with the moon god is something that they may have done. But it's clear from the Quran itself that you can't even worship anything that makes you think of something in the creation. This is very clear in Islam. That, what, that is the key that makes the monotheism of Islam so distinct and different from any other religion on earth today. Even the Christians and Jews who say we believe God is one, still don't have the monotheistic opinion of his isma wa safa or his characteristics, which is his names and so on, his attributes, nor in his uluhiya, the worship to him alone, nor in his rububiya or his lordship. So if you know that, you understand right away, this tawheed or oneness, monotheism in Islam is so unique, it's impossible that anybody is saying, oh, I believe in Allah and the moon at the same time just doesn't work. By the way, we sent email to Dr. Robert Morey some years ago. He said, I don't debate with anybody except with scholarly background and their credentials. So I sent them my credentials. I never do that because I don't want people calling me by a doctor or anything like that because it's not why I'm here. I didn't come out here to sell you anything and I didn't come out here to get a job in a university. This came out to tell a little story about priests and preachers come to Islam. But when I provided the credentials, he didn't answer us. Then he opened up the website. He's got a website out there. It's really bad. Attacking Islam, horrible. His whole website is not about what he believes. It's about what he doesn't believe about Islam. He, I, just attacking Islam. It's his only purpose. Beautiful looking website. Put it together really nice. Spend a lot of money on it. Keep it up, constantly attacking. Amazing. So I sent, they gave a list of all these people there that you could send email to. So I sent each one of them an email offering an opportunity that we'd like to discuss with him his opinion. Help us to understand a little better some things we don't know about our religion. His daughter responded and I actually got to open up a conversation with her. She agreed that, yeah, my dad will do that, no problem, he'll come there, he'll teach. I said, that's good, help us, you know. It was set for February, year 2000. He was supposed to come to Georgetown University, a very prestigious university in Washington, D.C. Imam Yahya Hindi was made aware of it. Dr. John Esposito was made aware of it. They both worked at that university. And they have the big dialogue center there for this. And I said, this is perfect. Bring them in. Dr. John Esposito has written a lot of books about Islam, although he's a Christian. And I said, this is great. Come on. I won't even do it. It won't even be me. Okay? Sit with another Christian who's an expert in Christianity. And you can do that. Guess what? February came and went. March came and went, and basically every month since then came and went, and we never heard from him again. But he still sells his books, it borders books and music, Barnes and Noble, Amazon.com, they still sell the book.
they make money out of it. We've tried to offer a challenge to at least show us any proof besides that one book that he has. But today, many, many people attacking Islam take his book and want to go out there and use it as a reference. And they do. Even though it's riddled with all kinds of mistakes, errors, inaccuracy, and bald-faced lies. Allah guide him. We pray for our enemies in Islam. Isn't that nice? I bet he didn't pray for us. But we pray for him. Allah guide him. Good question. What's my opinion about Paul? Did he believe in the true way or was he trying to distort the message of Jesus preached? According to the Bible, Paul's real name was Saul. He was a Pharisee. According to other stories, Christian history, he was engaged to the daughter of the high priest, another Pharisee. Her name was Popeia. Historically, we know about her because she's mentioned in the works of Josephus. And she couldn't stand this man. He was an ugly looking person. According to the Bible too, he was not attractive. So she left. She broke off the engagement by leaving. She left her dad or she left her house. She left her religion. She became an actress, a stage person. I don't know if they were they really acting or dancing, what she did. But Caesar married her. She married Caesar. And it was right after this that the father, her father, gave Paul his last papers and said, this is it. His final papers were given to him to go to Damascus, Damascus in Syria, where he was going to persecute again the people of the way. Along the way, he said he had a blinding light experience. Jesus talked to him and he became Paul and began getting all kinds of spiritual revelation through dreams, visions, etc. And everything he had was from that. He never knew Jesus other than through these blinding light experiences or whatever they were. This is all narrated in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's interesting, according, I did a little bit of research with uh, some materials from Ahmadidat, Dr. Jamal Bedoui, some of the others. I was still new to Islam when I was looking at this. That was a stumbling block for me, by the way. And I realized, here's an amazing thing. I read it all my life and didn't catch it until I read somebody else telling me about it. So in this way, I do appreciate the work that some of these scholars have done because it helps you to see. Paul told the story three times in the book of Acts and not one of them is the same as the other. Read it. He says, in the first instance, he's the only one that hears or sees anything. The next instance, they hear it, they don't see it, or they see it and they don't hear it. But he's the only one falling to the ground, they're just standing there. And he gets blind twice, but in the third time he doesn't get blind, everybody sees it and hears it, everybody falls down and hears his message, etc., etc. So the story is not the same. According to the Bible, it says that Paul said that he's dead to the law. He said, because of the law, I sin. If it weren't for the law, I wouldn't sin. Therefore, I'm dead to the law, and the law is dead to me. He also broke the commandments and taught that you could break the commandments because he said, you don't have to circumcise anymore. You don't have to do the khatan. You don't do that khatan anymore. You just have circumcision of the heart. Well, that has a lot of problems. I won't go into it right now, but that's kind of strange. Because this is just a question and answer thing, I'll refer to one thing and get off the subject. Jesus told them, according to what we have in the Bible, if you want to believe the Bible, it says in Matthew 5, 17, 18, 19, Jesus told them, don't think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but rather to fulfill. And not until all things are accomplished shall a single dot, jot, iota, tittle, be in any wise lessened. 
Can't change any word. Isn't that strange? You know what I just read to you? Those are five words that are in five different versions and they're changed. The word itself. Amazing. But he continues and he says, Whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this will be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches this will be the highest in the kingdom. And look at the next statement. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, the religious people, you will never enter paradise. Paul was a Pharisee. Next question. Why do I wear Arabic clothing? Well, for one thing, this is kind of heavy and it's warm. <laughs> it's cold today. I like people to know I'm a Muslim. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm very, very proud of it. If they don't like it, Allah guide them. The only time that I will compromise, because I don't have to compromise how I wear, is if there will be a benefit. When I ride in an airplane today, most people are terrified already to get in an airplane before any Muslim ever gets in it. But if they see a Muslim in an airplane, they start shaking. And you see them when we get on the ground and they're going <sighs> But just walking down the street, there may come a day, maybe when we can't be safe just to wear our clothes anymore, I don't know. The second question, why the beard? That's funny. Why do you have eyebrows? Allah put it there. Are you asking me why I don't shave it off? Why don't you shave off your eyebrows? Why? If you're going to say, well, because everybody does it, well, now that's always a good reason to do something, isn't it? If everybody else does it, that's your excuse. Huh? What do the majority of the people of Melbourne do on Friday night? They don't come to religious lectures, do they? No. The majority of the people in this room are Muslim. The majority of the people that we invited to come, the non-Muslims, saw fit to do something else. And most of them are going to have a hangover tomorrow because of it. Am I right or wrong? So the most of the people in the world today, in the free world that I know about, get drunk, waste their money, and act like fools on Friday and Saturday night. So is that an excuse that I can go do it too? Is it? So when you cut your beard off, why'd you do it? Why? Did Rasulullah tell you to cut it? Or let it grow? Sahih Bukhari, volume, I think it's volume 8, hadith number 798. I think that's where it is. We can find it for you though. Let it grow. Leave it alone. Let it grow out and cut this. That's what it says in the Hadith. But a brother comes to me and he says, Imam, please make dua for me. I said, okay. For what? He said, make dua, I can grow my beard. Make dua, I'll grow my beard. I said, I can't do that. He said, why? I said, that shirt. He said, shirt? How is it shirk? Did you make dua for me to grow my beard? Shirk means to make partners with Allah. You want me to make partners with Allah? He said, no, I just ask you to make dua that I'll, I want to grow my beard. Just, just make dua, I'll grow my beard. I said, I can't. Because it is Allah who grows your beard, not you. But I will make dua that you quit cutting it off. Alhamdulillah. One brother, he said, yeah, but you know my wife, she, she said, it, you know, she really likes me to shave it off and keep it smooth. I said, you got to wonder about a woman who wants her husband to look 
like another woman. Do you know they never invited me back to that community again? I don't know why. When we preach Islam to people, what should we talk about? Allah. What should we talk about? Allah. What was the first thing I talked about when I came on stage? You remember? I said, I'm going to tell you about a word. The word is Allah. Why we use the word? Because it means the only one worthy to be worshipped. He has no partners. He's one, unique, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. There's nothing that happens except by his command. He is the owner. He's the ruler on the day of judgment. He's the only one that you can turn to for your needs. The only one that really cares. The only one that you should care about. Pleasing him. That's what you're talking about. Sometimes I quote hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu said about Allah. I like this one. Whoever tries to please the people at the expense of displeasing Allah, Allah is displeased with that person and he makes the people displeased. But whoever tries to please Allah, even at the expense of displeasing the people, Allah is pleased with them and he'll make the people be pleased with them eventually. This is a good hadith. He said that. And so many times the non-Muslim says to me, that makes sense. We should do what we do for God, not for showing off. Say, all right. Makes sense. Talk about the law. Hmm. Oh, hat. Hat. I thought it said hut. What does the hut, hat, and dress have to do with conversion to Islam? And relevant is the dress. I guess, I don't understand the question. But if you're asking about my clothes, I didn't know you guys were so fascinated in clothing, but just to, to tell you that I like it. I really like it. I used to wear suits. I was in business. Suits which had belts that were real, real tight, you know, and a vest. And you know what? When you're going to go eat with Muslims, they're going to force food on you, am I right? <laughs> you better have some place to put it. <laughs> and having that belt around you, you ain't where it's at. So you just... Oh. I gained a hundred pounds. <laughs> okay. Somebody said, I read that there are some differences between one Bible and another. Tell us some of these differences. I'll do better than that. Because if I tell you something tonight, you're not going to remember it tomorrow. I tell you, you're not going to remember it. You won't. But I'll tell you what you can do. Go to the website, because I wrote all of it down and put it on the website. Go to islamtomorrow.com slash Bible and read every chapter of the book that I wrote. All our stuff is free. I didn't make it as a book so you could buy it. I made it as a book on the internet so you could just have it free. And that's one of the books. Bible, A Closer Look. Read it. Enjoy it. Print it out. Go sell it. Have a good time. I like you guys. You laugh at my silly jokes. Said, I also read the Bible doesn't discuss all the life issues. But the Quran discussed everything, for example... Something about money of the prophets after their death to distribute. Okay, inheritance, etc. Actually, I don't know. You may know more about this than me. What I know is pretty limited. I'm just a new guy on the block. Set with people of knowledge, but not much of it rubbed off on me. I tried. But what I learned was that <clears throat> the Quran and something like it complete the deen for us. The Qur'an and something like it complete the deen for us. It's a hadith. Muhammad Wasallam said, I've been sent with the Qur'an and something like it. Meaning what? His sunnah. We know that his sunnah explains Islam. The Qur'an tells us 
For instance, iqama salah, establish the worship. But where in the Quran does it say that you pray asr whenever the shadow is twice the length of the object? Where does it say in the Quran that you pray fajr just as soon as the light first starts from the day? Where does it say in the Quran that duhr is right after the sun hits the median and starts to move over? Where does it say any of that? It doesn't, does it? How do you know? In fact, how do you know it's five times a day? Salawat al-Khams is not in the Quran. You know it from the Sunnah. So, when you mention the Quran, the Quran tells us to look to the Sunnah, to obey Allah, Allah's Messenger, because obedience to Him is obedience to Allah. And Allah also used this phrase in the Quran, When he said, if you really love Allah, kul in kuntun tuhibun Allah fatabi uni yubukum Allah. If you say, if you really love Allah, then follow me. Then, and only then, will Allah love you and will forgive your sins. He's the forgiver, the merciful. So we know that between the two, the sunnah, the hadith, the stories, the narrations, and the Quran, it is complete deen. Everything is there. And within that, it covers everything. Not just about inheritance, by the way. Check this out. Tell me any religion that has documentation from their prophet showing you how to go to the toilet correctly. Huh? Nobody. In fact, they don't even tell you how to eat. The Prophet Islam taught us when you eat or drink, sit down. A few years ago, I was coming back from a program late at night and I was so tired I couldn't drive. And I put my head down on the steering wheel at the red light and my little daughter was with me. She said, Daddy, wake up, wake up. I said, I can't, I'm falling asleep. I put my head back on the steering wheel. The light turned green. She said, Daddy, wake up. She turned the radio all the way up. And it wasn't music because I listened to those talk shows, right? Guess what? First words come out of that radio. Always sit down when you eat or drink. Never stand up when you eat or drink. I said, what's that? Who's this? Jamaat Tablik is in town. That's the Sunnah. Allah Akbar. And the guy continues and he's saying that the damage that's caused to the esophagus, the stomach, the bowel, the this and that, and he's going on and on and all the damage is done just because you're standing up when you're eating and drinking. Half hour program. I was home by the time it was over and I'm thinking, wow. Now, if I stand up or sit down based on what I heard from this man, it won't be from Allah, will it? If I sit down now because I know my health will benefit from it. Because the doctor said so, that means I didn't accept from Muhammad Sallallahu I accepted it from somebody, some non-Muslim telling me that. Make sense? Amazing, huh? We have a program many years ago we did called Just a Sunnah. It de deals with so many of the things in the Sunnah that we wouldn't know without this. Food is one. How to sit when you eat. How you hold your hand. Which hand you eat with. Which hand you clean with. All of that we know from the sunnah. But there's more. So much more. And I heard so many Muslims say something like this. It really hurt me when I got in Islam. I heard some Muslims attacking our own religion. And when you'd say, brother, how come you do so and so and you don't do such and so? Brother, that's just a sunnah. Brother, that's just sunnah. Just sunnah. Just sunnah. So that's why we called it just a sunnah. And we give all the proofs of the beauty of Islam to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's also in the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
that after the Salat that you shot, not to have any program, but to go take some rest so you can get up in the night and worship a lot. So with that in mind, I want to end this little Barnabich, this little program, so I can try to follow that sooner and ask that all of us will be successful in doing the same thing. I'm happy to be here with my brothers and sisters. And I thank Allah for letting me come here to Australia. And I thank all of you for your attendance and your patience in our program tonight. I have only one request from all of you. Uh, I'm going to make two requests. Can I do that too? First request. First request, make dua. Second request, see if we can come back and do it again. Salam alaikum. I didn't get very far, did I? But I don't mind. My paycheck's coming. I'll wait. I'll be patient. You see, what I want from Allah, you can't give me. I want to watch people when they make their shahada so I can remember how much I really, really felt the day I made shahada. So anytime somebody wants to enter Islam, I don't mind waiting. Take your time. Come on over here. Come on, it's okay. Yeah, come on, right over here. Hi, how are you? What do you think about Islam? I think it's the truth. Okay, let's see if this... Yeah, you can get up close to that. Tell me your name. Michael. My name is Yusuf. What we're going to do right now is go over a couple of points with you and see if you agree. We as Muslims believe there really is a God. So much so that we think about Him a lot all day long. And we try our best to do what He wants us to do. We know we're going to mess up, but we always ask Him to forgive us and we try again the next day. We believe he's one and he doesn't have partners. And we believe his message came as the Quran. Do you believe that? Okay. And we believe that he sent a lot of messengers with this message. Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses, Solomon, David and Jesus and Muhammad. Do you believe that? Okay. And there's a lot of things as you go through life you learn more and more. You never learn everything, but each day is a new experience. You take one step at a time. So today is your first step, and this step is the easiest step. But it has the most profound effect on your life right now. In English, I will say it, and then we can do it in Arabic. Is that fair? Okay. Just repeat after me. I bear witness. I bear witness. In open testimony. There is no God to worship except the one true God, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger and Jesus is his messenger. Now we'll do the Arabic. It's real simple and I'll do it slow and you just say what I say. It means exactly the same thing, inshallah. Ashadu. Allah ilaha. La ilaha. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Wa Isa Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. Now, before you leave, I want to tell you that this is the best day of your life. Because what just happened on this stage right here 
is an amazing thing that was described by John the Baptist and Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them. Because what they said was when a person entered into the right belief, into the way of Islam, Allah forgives all of your sins since the day you were born, restores you now to the original condition as a newborn virgin baby, and where he removed all the sins, he replaced it with mountains and mountains of good deeds. So you're the richest person in all of Melbourne right now. Because you have all these mountains of good deeds, no sins, and your prayers are accepted immediately from him now. And the first prayer from you, I hope you'll make for me and for us that Allah forgive us and make us good Muslims. Amen. Amen. Okay. And now you will be responsible to take care of her and help her step by step. Inshallah, you have a big job, but you have a big reward. Because just teaching somebody Bismillah will get you a reward for that forever and ever. Because she said this so many times. And her children and grandchildren and so, you have a great opportunity with Allah. Jazakumallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. I remember something about the Sahabi that whenever something like this happened, they didn't copy the way of the before by clapping they used to say Allahu Akbar and I like that so if you want to say that it's good keep saying it it's good for us I feel good I like it I love it yeah man Allahu Akbar I gotta tell you if I got time to tell them a funny story we got time for a funny story? Some of you know that I, I work as a national chaplain. I'm really retired now, but I work harder now than when I was getting paid. But I had the opportunity, and I grabbed it in a minute, to be the Muslim delegate as a chaplain to the United Nations World Peace Summit for Religious Leaders. In the year 2000, and it was an amazing thing, amazing. But one of the things that happened while I was there for that week at the United Nations building, I, I only, by the way, we had more people than this, okay? Only religious leaders from around the world. Muslims, Hindus, lots of Christians, Orthodox, Catholics, Jews of all kinds. And the one who put up all the money for this event, because it costs money to do it, he put up one billion dollars. Yes. His name is Ted Turner. You ever heard of CNN? Yeah. But he wanted to broadcast it on his network, so he put up a billion. Oh yeah. Plus, he wanted to be the keynote speaker. Okay. Plus, he wanted to tell everybody about his new religion because he became a Janist, one of the Hindus religions. They have many religions from the Hindus, breakoffs, and he was a Janist, and he wanted to talk about it. Okay? I'm setting the story up because you've got to see what happened. Through the whole thing, people gave speeches after speeches, and I was supposed to give a speech. That's why I was there. Alhamdulillah, it didn't work out, they didn't let me give it, but I'll tell you what did happen. Muslims were clapping right along with everybody else for each thing that happened. Somebody say anything and they get ready to go, or, 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 you know. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that because I said, I'm a Muslim now, I have to do what the Muslims do. So, uh, most of the stuff people said, I didn't believe it anyway, a lot of weird stuff they were talking about. But sometimes, it doesn't matter if they're Christian or Jew, they said good things that we should really acknowledge. So, on the second day, I said, no, nah, I'm not going to play this game. I'm not going to clap and I don't want to sit still, so I'm going to do it. Allah Akbar! And the people looked at me, they were clapping all, all oh.
And they didn't know where it came from. And then somebody said something a little later on. It was really great. Everybody jumped to their feet, standing ovation. I jumped up. Hello, Akbar! Now they know it's that guy over there, the one in the weird clothes. Oh, as a Muslim. The guards, security guards, they were looking at me like. 61 year old man, they're afraid. <laughs> I didn't even have a briefcase. <laughs> Kofi Annan came, gave a speech, then they introduced Ted Turner. And he came out, and, they, and it's a weird deal, by the way. Like, this is a podium on a stage. In the United Nations, the podium is up real high. And they have to climb up there. It's like a mimbar in reverse, you know, and he hangs off the end of it. And he's up, you know. But I happen to be sitting up like that, even with him. Okay? Ted Turner got up there, and they didn't like what I was saying, you know. So before he started, now I think, in front of all the people on television, he paid a billion dollars to tell his story. But before he started his story, he pointed right at me. And he said, are you going to say that again? The cameras go right on to me. And I go, it all depends on what you say. He was so frustrated. He couldn't think what to say. They had introduced him as the world's most wealthy man in real estate. They said nobody owns more real estate property, housing, than this man. Number one, besides his interest that he has in broadcasting, he's number one in real estate, property. Wow. And his speech starts like this. <sighs> you know, I'm really worried about people of the world today. So many people are homeless. They have no place to go and nowhere to live. When he backed up from the microphones, guess what? I said, hello, Akbar! From the man who has the most real estate, he can take care of everybody! <laughs> there was nobody there that could keep from laughing on that one. <laughs> but it cost me. I didn't get to give the speech, but I said, you know what? I'll take those two words right there on Yamo Kiyama over any speech that was given. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Now, I'm going to leave, inshallah, but I don't want you to stop saying it till I get out of here. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right. Jazakum Allah khair. He's gone now. It's my turn. May Allah reward you. Allahu Akbar always, inshallah. Allah is the greatest. My dear brothers and sisters, last night, we were stunned, amazed by what we saw on television. Obviously, this is something that is upsetting and frustrating. And we as Muslims, we would like to pay our condolences to those who have suffered through this. We dislike terror, regardless where it comes from. Whomever was behind this, whether they're Jews, Christian, Buddhist, monks, Muslims, we as Muslims condemn that action. As we condemn the action of the Americans in Iraq and the Zionists in Palestine and the Russians in Chechnya and the Indians in Kashmir, we condemn these actions and we dislike any person or any group that causes terror. We had to clarify this. We dislike them because Allah dislikes them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Al-Quran, Inna Allah la yuhibbu al Allah does, Allah dislikes the transgressors. So this is something that we need to clarify. We've had many questions, so I just thought I'd clarify this. My dear brothers and sisters, tomorrow, our lecturer, may Allah reward him, 
Brother Yusuf Staz, he'll be given another talk, inshallah, in Copeland Theatre, Melbourne University, um, Gate 12. And the talk will be, the lecture of it will be, Who is Going to Paradise? So it's a very, very interesting talk, inshallah. And, and I hope that he'll recover, inshallah, by tomorrow fully. May Allah reward each one of you for attending here. You have inspired us and you've encouraged us. And I ask Allah the Almighty to keep the Muslims steadfast on Islam. And I ask Allah to guide the non-Muslims to Islam. Wallah, the greatest asset that we have, the greatest privilege that we have is Islam. And we as Muslims should not be misers and greedy and selfish. We should share this beauty of Islam with our actions and our behavior. Many of us speak about Islam, but unfortunately when it, when it comes to practical action, they seem to be far away from it. Let us live Islam, my dear brothers and sisters, so we can show it to others, because the others are stumbling in the dark. They are in need to give nutrition to their soul. They are given it with football, they are given it with drugs, with alcohol, with gambling, and it's not satisfying. The real nutrition for the soul is Al-Islam, the religion of God, the religion, the religion of all the prophets. Please, as you're walking out, there's a lot of videos, DVDs, audio, and also there's a form which is called a dollar a day. This helps us continue on bringing quality speakers as you can see. Please, may Allah reward you. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless each one of you and would really appreciate if you can donate generously so we can maintain, inshallah, this good work. I would like to thank every one of you here. I'd like to thank our sponsors. May Allah reward you all and our special guest. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Please drive safely. Barakallahu feekum ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum.